Good morning, everyone. I'm Fritz Mayer, a Dean of the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies here at the University of Denver. It's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this very special event on the economic case for U.S. leadership on climate change. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, before we begin, let me thank our co-sponsors, the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, the Chambers of, uh, for Innovation and Clean Energy, and the Clean Energy and Business Network. Thank you, co-sponsors. Our subject today could hardly be more important uh, as this summer's wildfires, the record number of violent weather events, reports of ever shrinking Arctic ice coverage, and a host of other warning signs demonstrate all too clearly climate change is upon us. And too often the situation is, is posed as something of a choice between climate and economy, that somehow we can't afford to respond to the climate crisis. As today's discussion will address, this really is a false choice. There is a path forward, there is an economic case for addressing climate change. And, and that's a path that the US can and, and really should lead on. We have an incredible panel of industry leaders and experts with us today. Um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. We're also joined by very special guests uh, this morning, uh, Colorado senior United States Senator Michael Bennett. Senator Bennett is really one of the Senate's leaders on issues of energy, climate, and conservation, among other things. Uh, so we are so pleased to have you with us today, Senator Bennett. Um, before we get started, would you like to, to say a few words? Sure. Th thank you, Dean. Can you hear me? I've learned to ask that question at the beginning. Great. Yeah. Yes, thank uh, you. Yeah, I, I want to thank you and the other panelists for your amazing, for your contribution to our clean energy leadership in Colorado. And thanks to the Corbell School for focusing on this issue. I just spent the last four days in rural Colorado having conversations uh, about uh, the economy and climate change. So for me, this is a very timely conversation to have. Uh, in many of those places were some of the redder parts of our state, not blue parts of our state. And for the last four years, I've been saying to anybody who would listen that those of us that believe climate change in real, is real uh, and that we need to do something about it have to win the economic case for dealing with climate change. It's the only way that we'll win the case. And if you're incredibly bored one night, Dean, I actually wrote a book that spends a, a bunch of pages on this issue. And the short version is this. We should have never lost an economic argument on climate change to Donald Trump. He prosecuted a case that fighting climate change was somehow bad for the economy and bad for jobs, when everyone here knows that the exact opposite is true, especially in Colorado, where we led the country's first renewable energy standard and limits on fugitive methane. Those didn't hurt our economy. They strengthened it by spurring jobs and increasing tax revenue for our communities. The same, by the way, could be said for the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act. So when President Trump attacks our climate policy, he's conjuring an economy that no longer exists. Instead of comprehending the economy we need now, more than 3 million Americans work in the clean energy economy. Jobs make our homes and businesses more energy efficient, are one of the largest and fastest growing employment opportunities in the energy sector, and those jobs can never be exported overseas. Over the next 20 years, the world is on track to invest about $10 trillion in clean energy. I hope the United States will lead that investment, uh, more than all projected investment for fossil fuels. And if we don't lead, we risk ceding the next generation of clean energy jobs to countries like China. I had that conversation just yesterday in one of the reddest counties in Colorado. Today, China is already the world's top producer, exporter, and user of wind turbines, solar panels, and batteries. We are in fourth place. And the latest forecasts uh, expect that over 75% of the world's mega factories for battery production will be in China. Just 6% will be in the United States. China isn't torturing itself with a manufactured debate about whether climate change is real or what it's going to do to its economy. They're working to win the race for clean energy jobs and clean energy income. 
There's no reason America shouldn't win that race. And I believe we still can. And it's especially urgent now that we're in a major economic crisis. Back in 2009, federal investments in clean energy and climate solution helped spark our economic recovery in Colorado. They helped lead us out of the Great Recession. And they can do it again in 2021. As I mentioned just this week, I visited communities that are grappling with how to protect themselves from wildfire risk. We need to invest in the real work and real jobs in rural Colorado needed to better manage this threat. Yesterday, I toured a cement plant that is exploring strategies to address the emissions from its incredibly complex uh, energy intensive operations. America needs to lead in designing these innovative job creating technologies. We also need to have a real answer for fossil fuel sector workers in their communities, places like Craig, Colorado, you know, that are feeling like they're gonna be left behind. Ineffective federal job training programs from the last century are not a plan. And we've got to invest in credible pathways to people to transition to good paying jobs. We need to ensure that new opportunities and growth take root in communities before they face the prospect of job loss and a shrinking tax base. And let me tell you, that can't be an afterthought. It has to be front and center. And I'm incredibly optimistic that if Joe Biden wins the presidency and Democrats win the Senate, we can tackle the challenges we face and start rebuilding American leadership. We can advance climate solutions that will unleash a chain reaction of job creation in Colorado and across the country. But to do any of that, we got to make and win the economic case on, in, on climate, which is why I'm so looking forward to the discussion today and so grateful to be part of it. Thanks, Dean, for having me. I look forward to our conversation. Well, thank you, uh, Senator, for those remarks and for being here. Uh, that tees it up beautifully. Let me introduce the rest of our panel or our panel um, in alphabetical order. Um, uh, it is a great panel. Uh, Doug Campbell, uh, who is the CEO of Solid Power Inc., which is an industry leading developer of a next generation all solid state batteries based here in Colorado. Um, Colin Hendricks, my colleague, professor and director of Corbell School Sustainability Initiatives and a fellow at the Peterson Institute. Welcome, Colin. Uh, Kelly Kizier, Associate Vice President for International Climate at the Environmental Defense Fund. She does a lot of work uh, connecting with the international processes um, and we'll talk about that. Niraj Swami, who is a Senior Advisor at applied, for Applied AI and Innovation Ventures at the Nature Conservancy, which is a very cool title and founding partner of SCAD Ventures, which is a venture capital fund investing in companies focused on conservation. And I believe Emily uh, is here with us now. Uh, Emily Wangerman, Vice President of Business Development at LightSource BP, which is a, a world leading solar energy and storage company. So it's a fabulous group. Um, um, the format today, I'm gonna moderate a discussion for the next 35 or 40 minutes. Uh, and then we will open for a Q&A. So if you want to put your questions, uh, those of you in the audience, uh, in the Q&A, we will get to as many of them as possible. Uh, so with, uh, with that, let me jump in. Um, let me start with our, our, our business leaders. Um, so the question is really how your companies have been able both to lead on climate and be competitive. And maybe I'll start with our Colorado business uh, person, uh, Doug Campbell. Doug, how would you answer that question? Oh, I was on mute. <laughs> you were on mute. Yes. We, we've all been there. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, solid power, we're really on, on, the, on the forefront of vehicle electrification. Um, and so I think, you know, we're, we're sort of front and center um, when it comes to, comes to climate change. We are addressing basically the number one market pain points for electric vehicles, which is, improving the performance and, and reducing the cost. Um, so I'd say we're really, we're, we're, we are right in the trenches, shall we say, both in terms of, of doing what we can to address climate change, but also, uh, you know, representing US, um, US industry as being at the forefront. Well, that's great. And, and, and let me ask um, really the same question of you, Emily, um, uh, at LightSource, um, how have you been able 
to navigate this um, uh, balance between addressing the climate and being uh, economically competitive? Great question. Uh, LightSource BP, we believe in responsible solar. And what that means is uh, not only are we providing clean energy at an affordable rate for customers, but we go beyond just providing that energy. And we get involved in the community as well as give back to the environment. And so a couple of things that we do, for instance, is when we engage in a community, we work with the local community, for instance, uh, to hire locally. And so that provides local jobs. For instance, our Bighorn Solar, which is located in Colorado, in Pueblo, Colorado, uh, we're working together with Grid Alternatives uh, to pair um, local, uh, local Pueblo community uh, members with the actual uh, construction. And so we'll be we'll able to hire locally. Additionally, we also engage from an overall environmental perspective. For instance, at our Penn State projects, which uh, we just announced today, uh, we had a groundbreaking today for 70 megawatts of uh, solar in southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, we are engaged heavily in the community. We do uh, community tours. We've had uh, multiple community um, events where people can come and actually learn about the solar. And then also from a, a direct community perspective, we have things like um, you know, providing long-term revenue for our, um, for our landowners. And so it helps supplement their farming and then also giving back in a tax basis. For our big corn project in Colorado, we're giving back over 22 million in taxes. And so, you know, there's lots of ways to give back to the community. So not only are you doing things like providing low cost solar, but you're also giving, we're also giving back to the community in um, engagement as well as in local jobs. Um, the last thing that we do is we provide a lot of educational opportunities. For instance, in Penn State, um, we have uh, internships uh, provided. Our interns this year were great. Uh, they really impacted. In fact, they actually um, did the press release for the Penn State announcement today. So go look at it. It's pretty exciting. They all did it and it was, you know, internships driving that activity. And then also we have uh, research and all those opportunities. And we do that across the board. It's not just, um, you know, if somebody asks for it, it's an expectation that we lead from a responsible solar perspective. That's terrific. And uh, we should talk offline about how we can get our students uh, in on those internships. Um, but thank Definitely. you for that. Let me turn to Niraj. Uh, your, your, your venture capital firm is, is really investing in businesses. Um, uh, like, I suppose, like Solid Power and Light Source B BP and other uh, perhaps uh, smaller startups. What are you seeing um, in terms of the market uh, and, the, and the prospects for companies like that? Thanks, Fritz. I think, you know, just echoing some of the sentiments I'm hearing, I'm actually a technologist entering into the climate space. And, you know, one mental model that we've thought about with climate is think about it as a social network that's just various things in nature connected with various things in people, diverse people globally. The story on climate change is so global, but the actual challenges happen at the local level. Um, and so what we're starting to see and the, the theme that I think really resonates is it's starting to spark a data economy around understanding truth, understanding behaviors, understanding mm -hmm. how people and nature's relationship is impacted as a result of which we're seeing what we're seeing with the climate. Um, competitively, I know I think it really draws in focus on local action, um, engagement, collaboration at the point where the problem's occurring. Um, the satellites are great, but ground truth is real. Um, indigenous people, um, local you know, socioeconomic situations. This is where the problem becomes a real a different reality. And I think we see the potential for technology, um, AI, data science, just think the people that are at the fringes of climate change to start making impact and start adding a competitive language of, hey, you know, what are my actions, my choices, whether I'm a supply chain company, I'm a manufacturer, or even if I'm software, what am I doing to help this planet? Um, and that just changes the whole dialogue with talent because now everybody's talking about the same problem. Uh, it's not about pay. It's not about incentives. It's about saving something that's a shared good. That's been a big part of the thesis, you know, both across SCAD as well as some of the advisorship that I've been involved with. Yeah, that's very good. It's so fascinating. We have this huge global problem. And in, in, in the end, it's all of these local actions that make the difference. Um, thank you for that. Let me, let me, uh, 
widen this, the lens even further uh, a bit and turn to my colleague, Colin Hendricks. And Colin, you've listened to the, 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 the business cases. Um, let, me, let me step even further back and, and, and ask you, from your perspective, what's really at stake for the U.S. here? You, you heard Senator Bennett note that we were fourth in, uh, uh, on some measures in this space, but what's at stake for the U.S. in terms of, of national security, economic competitiveness, promoting peace and prosperity? Sure, thank you very much, Fritz, and uh, thank you to my uh, co-panelists. I think that I'm going to make that argument on sort of three separate sets of grounds. So I'm going to make an argument about economic competitiveness. I'm going to make an argument about U.S. national security interests. And finally, I'm going to make an argument that really speaks to the heart of a lot of this discourse that has revolved around the concept of energy security here at home in the United States. So starting with the economic case, actually, the senator uh, managed to make the argument probably in a more succinct fashion than I could have. I, um, and so it is very clear that globally, um, governments, but also private markets are going to be investing incredible sums of money in catalyzing technological innovation and transitioning energy systems and transportation systems away from, from carbon. Now, the United States can choose to be on that train, right? Or it can sit it out. And if it chooses to sit it out, if it chooses not to play that kind of role in catalyzing broad investment and, and then, then helping to create these kind of markets that are necessary uh, and, and market dynamics that are necessary to pull in private capital, we're going to wind up sourcing that technology from abroad. So if you are making the argument in terms of economic competitiveness, that one of our main goals is to reduce our trade deficits, and we can argue whether or not that's the right goal to be pursuing, but that is certainly an argument the Trump administration has made forcefully, not getting on the bandwagon is going to result in actually deepening those deficits. So I think that that would be the, the primary kind of economic competitiveness smart, uh, argument. Um, the second has to do with sort of the national security case uh, for leadership on climate change. So if the United States, again, sits this out and cedes the field to the European Union and China principally in terms of exerting global leadership uh, in, in climate mitigation, it's going to affect U.S. national security in at least three ways. Uh, the first is kind of amorphous but important. It's going to affect uh, the image of the United States and our ability to project uh, and use soft power to our advantage. And soft power is not the power of our military. It's the power of our ideals and our uh, demonstrated willingness to work internationally through international institutions to solve collective problems. Now, if we can't exert leadership in that space, what the result is going to be that we will find fewer friends who are willing to work with us on things like trade and investment uh, and even security cooperation. Mm. Um, second, among, among the national security threats, it, it's already manifesting itself as a clear and present danger for the United States in a variety of ways. Um, the wildfires that are occurring in the Western United States right now are just one, uh, one instantiation of that. Um, and so it's, it's directly affecting homeland security as on the first point, but it's also going to, to, to change potentially the mission set that the United States national security community is required to attend to as climate change poses really significant risk for political stability, um, especially in lower and middle income countries. Uh, that are going to necessitate some, 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 some reactive responses, especially since many of those places that are becoming destabilized by climate change are is, is creating ungoverned pockets where armed groups like Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb uh, or the Islamic State can operate. Um, and then just one last point on that little piece of it, you know, not beginning this process of decarbonization is going to not just have negative consequences for the US economy, but it's also going to artificially prop up the economies of some really malign actors in the international system, principally Russia and Saudi Arabia. We are a huge consumer and a huge producer of energy. The decisions we make at home matter and are extremely consequential. The longer we delay doing that, the more we allow the resource rents from oil and natural gas uh, export to prop up these kind of actors in the international system. And then very briefly on this energy security discourse, an energy system that is contributing to these global problems and uh, that is also contributing to wildfires like the ones we are experiencing at home is not in any sense secure. It might provide the United States with a kind of a, a, a notional energy independence in the sense that we're not importing oil, uh, but we are bringing up upon ourselves a host of problems and forestalling the opportunity to really make a positive impact in exert leadership in this space. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. You certainly make a strong case as to, to, to reinforce the points that Senator Bennett began with as to why this, uh, this really does matter. 
Now, it turns out, um, though, that we're not alone in the world and that there, uh, you know, uh, other countries are thinking about this and uh, particularly, as you note, the European Union and, and China and, and elsewhere. Um, so let's, let's turn to that question. Let me bring in uh, Kelly Kizier um, from your perch at the Environmental Defense Fund. Of course, you're very involved with the international arena and I, I know you've uh, worked very closely with the European Union. I wonder if you could, you could uh, tell us a bit about what you see happening in Europe. Thank you, Brett, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm actually a Colorado native, but I took a bit of a left turn and um, was a policymaker in the EU for 20 years. And as you say, I was a negotiator on the Paris Agreement. I also work on other UN processes um, dealing with um, sector-specific action like aviation and maritime. But I'm going to answer this question from the EU perspective, and of course we can broaden it to be more global if we want to. Um, I think there's a lot the US can draw from the EU experience. So the EU have set a mandatory emissions target. They started um, piloting um, for certain sectors as early as 2005. They've also now committed to climate neutrality by 2050. And the science is pretty clear on this. So to reach our shared temperature goal, the temperature goal set out in the Paris Agreement, um, two degrees or striving towards 1.5 degrees to avoid catastrophic climate change. Um, countries have to reduce their GHG emissions to net zero by around the middle of the century. Um, so the EU have set both a short-term and a long-term target, but I think the success of EU policy is based on the policies that set binding declining limits on climate pollution consistent with these targets, consistent with the net zero trajectory. So in the EU climate policy, which is really central to all policy, so investment policy, how governments use their budget, that's another thing I think the US could draw from, but climate policy covers all sectors of the economy. So specific targets and complementary policies address renewable energy, energy efficiency, land use and forestry, and of course, in all climate policy, we need to make sure that we also consider the most vulnerable populations. And EU policies also address these issues and I think are improving to better address these issues over time. That's gonna be incredibly important in the US context as well. The cornerstone policy in the EU is the emissions trading system. Um, and it's been a real success. Between uh, 2005 and 2018, um, the covered sectors reduced their emissions by 33%. Last year alone, the covered sectors reduced their emissions by 9%. That, that's 2019, sorry, pre-COVID. Um, the EU ETS, the EU Emissions Trading System, is the world's largest carbon market. And it provides EU industry and energy with flexibility so that the limits and targets are met in the most cost-effective way. So the EU tends to set the bar for climate ambition. But of course, we made an awful lot of mistakes along the way. The good news for the U.S. is they can learn from these mistakes. They don't need to repeat them. <laughs> We've given them an entire canon of mistakes <laughs> to learn from. But overall, I think EU climate action is a success story. And this goes back to some of the points Colin was making, and certainly to where um, Senator Bennett kicked us off. In 2019, EU emissions were down by 25%. But over the same period, the EU economy grew by 62%. So, Climate policy does not tank your economy. Um, in fact, EU companies are at the leading edge of the green economy. It's created jobs um, and they're reducing their emissions. So the EU is rapidly becoming a case study that proves that we can tackle climate change and ensure economic growth and job creation. Um, of course, US climate action needs to be tailored to the US context. It's not like the EU policy suite could just come and be applied um, directly. But the policies are proven and they can be tailored for success in the United States. And happy to speak to any of these in the questions or offline, even the mistakes. So reach out if you want to follow up and thank you so much for the opportunity today. Well, well thank you, Kelly. We're going to circle back around on some of these policy questions. Um, and it is fascinating to see the, the extent to which those policies do seem to have spurred the the business uh, response in, 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 in this space um, in Europe. I'm wondering if we could turn to, to what's happening elsewhere in the world, particularly in emerging markets and 
perhaps, perhaps Niraj, you, you might be able to comment on what you see in, in, in other uh, regions of the world. Absolutely. I think there's a couple of themes that, that start emerging with, with, with regions like, you know, I can speak for India, some work that we've seen in China, um, just that there's a lot of learning to be accelerated um, by thinking about collaboration, education, there's collateral benefits of focusing on climate, right? Because it's a problem that can be seen and can be contained in a region too, um, in a way where you can start creating labs around parks, um, where you start generating data from quicker experimentation, involving local you know, private sector as well as education sector. Um, it becomes a problem where you kind of have a thesis that lets multiple types of different types of participants come in and contribute. This has been something that we've seen in a, I'll share a story. There's a national park in the middle of, of, of a city of Mumbai in, in India. And this is guarded with this folks that live in a very dense, you know, densely populated region. Um, one of the unique things that's happened is that park has become a data lab where technologists, students, private companies are able to test out drones are able to see how they can monitor, you know, how people and nature are interacting. Like that's an opportunity to really tell a story, but also you get that right, you're multiplying the level of learning that can happen across other regions. There might not be other places on the planet or other regions where you could really have the luxury of doing that. I think, you know, if you try to translate that into what we have in the United States, we're blessed with beautiful nature. We're blessed with great winds. And in a lot of, and uh, trying to talk a lot about, you know, what's missing in climate and, and trying to talk about the, the, the action that needs to happen. You know, we, we have so many learnings and lessons that have worked that can be, become great, almost technological advertisements, right? Like ways to hook in the potential of engaging with other sectors that are at the periphery, but are very much impacted by climate. Um, I think, you know, that's where my head goes. It's really coming back to that cycle of how do we lean on art of the possible data innovation to make climate a, a citizen problem, not a problem that some mythical creature is going to solve, right? Like it's everybody's problem because everybody do something about it. Oh, that's, thank you for that uh, perspective. And, you know, both in your comments and Kelly's, the, you, it's a nice segue into to where I really want to go next with the conversation, which is, which is around policies. Uh, not that they set, you know, they solve the problem, but they create the context in which actors, s s private citizens, NGOs, businesses in this case, um, can, um, can work on the problem. And so let, let's, let's turn to the question of what policies might help. And, um, you know, I, 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 might, I might sort of turn back to our business uh, you know, uh, uh, leaders here um, to get your perspective on this and how federal or state policy could really spur innovation and investments um, that we need to, to decarbonize the economy. And um, Emily, do you want to uh, perhaps to turn to you, Emily, and then, and then I'll come back to you, Doug. Sure. So definitely, uh, federal and state policies are very important for renewables growth specifically. Um, you know, you'll see that in Europe, as Kelly just mentioned, it's made a big difference to have, um, you know, not just uh, local uh, decision making, but also, you know, across the EU and, and we actually have a large presence in, in Europe as light source BP. And so it's made a big difference for our growth. Most of our initial growth was in Europe because of the policies. Mm -hmm. um, in the US, you know, I, I can actually keep it local to Colorado. Um, it's made a big difference for us, the policies that, um, you know, that Governor Paulus and uh, Senator Bennett have actually set, you know, it makes a big difference because that's why we're there. In fact, one of our largest offices is located in Colorado because we have about a gigawatt of assets there and we plan to be there for the long run because of the policies there, you know, setting GHG emissions reductions uh, limits are key to the long-term success of the um, of the environment as well as of our overall industry. And so uh, definitely policies are key. For instance, uh, we actually have an agreement with, um, I was mentioning Bighorn earlier, it's a 300 megawatt project. Um, it's a very large project. It's actually on Evra's land, which is a steel industry. Um, and it's interesting because it's gonna be the cleanest steel in the world. 
And that's driven because of the policies that were set um, by Senator Bennett and Gov Governor Paulus because um, Excel had certain obligations that they had to meet. And so it's a really a three-way collaboration between us, Excel, and Evres. And so that's a great example of a public partnership, public-private partnership, excuse me, that was driven really by policy. And on a national level, uh, you may have just heard FERC today actually ruled that um, carbon markets, they're not going to basically prevent the state level carbon markets. And that's been a really popular discussion with FERC of late. Um, and it's not that they're necessarily promoting them, but they're not going to prevent them from going forward. And what I really look forward to is that no matter what happens on, uh, in November, that there is, you know, an opportunity to address a national carbon market. I think that sets the stage to introduce future revenue streams for renewables, as well as for traditional resources that they can really quantify the impact of carbon. So, you know, I think there's real benefits at state levels, for instance, you know, um, Colorado is really driving forward that growth, um, but also at the federal level, it's important to reinforce and introduce scale and introduce consistency because if each state has a different program, it can be hard for the uh, industry to follow through. Uh, thanks for that perspective. Uh let me, let me bring in, uh, as I said, uh, uh, Doug Campbell as, as well. From your perspective, Doug, what, what, are, the, what are the policies that would um, further incentivize and, and, and help businesses like yours um, thrive? Yeah, well, I think uh, Emily used a good, good term, um, um, essentially public-private um, initiatives. Um, and, and, and I'll start... I'll sort of uh, lead in with a very bold statement, and that bold statement is that, you know, I am gravely concerned that the U.S. will fall behind on technology innovation if we miss the boat on climate change. And, and the reason I, I can say that is, you know, before COVID, I spent a lot of time in Europe, a lot of time in Asia. Mm -hmm. I know what industry is doing overseas. I know what the governments are doing, and they're investing massively, and I mean massively. I just learned this week uh, from a call um, with some folks in India, that India has a multi-billion dollar initiative uh, to bring in uh, battery production to the country, um, specifically to support vehicle electrification. And, and unfortunately, I'm not seeing those kinds of initiatives really pop up here in the United States, at least yet. I'll use a ver another very real example. Just last week, we came out with a very major press release around uh, what we're doing in, in production of our solid state batteries right here in Colorado. We learned, um, because our, our VP of R&D is Chinese American, we actually learned that China picked that, that call up and they mm -hmm. used it as a lobbying tool to their government to say, look, mm -hmm. we're falling behind. We need even more massive investments mm -hmm. uh, around this. And, and, and again, what do we have here uh, in the United States working for us? We have uh, an entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, and an appetite for risk that, uh, frankly speaking, is unmatched on the world stage. Mm -hmm. But my, again, my concern is without public-private um, initiatives, we're going to fall behind because this, this train's leaving the station. Well, let me, let me pick up on that and ask an and sort of open question to, the, to all our panelists. Uh, in terms of what it will take to get us from here to where we'd like to be. A couple of things on the table, um, carbon markets, and we could talk in more detail about the, how they work and why they create an environment that's conducive to, to businesses um, entering and, and prospering in the sphere, uh, direct investments, public-private um, investments. Um, I'm curious, uh, and, and any of you could, could respond to this, what are the other, other sort of policy tools that we have that would help in this space? And I, and I could pick on, uh, I mean, Colin, maybe I'd ask you to sort of jump in in, 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 that, in that area. Sure. Um, you know, I think that one of the, one of the policies is a, is, a, is a foreign policy kind of choice, which is that the United States needs to, to reassert its support for the Paris Agreement. Um, being left out of that, even if we are taking the domestic steps to achieve some of the targets that have been identified in that, is going to be a blow to U.S. leadership uh, in a variety of international institutions, including international economic institutions that have underpinned a, a very successful and, 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 and not continuous, but, um, but, but an incredibly prosperous uh, U.S. economy in the post-war era. That's one thing. I do think that carbon taxes uh, make a lot of sense, in part just because they really facilitate true cost accounting of what it, what it, what it is costing us as a society 
to, to stick to these kind of leg legacy uh, energy sources. Um, there, there's a variety of true cost accounting that we could be doing. One of those things is, is pricing the, the, the externalities associated with carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. The other one is to think about the public health consequences as well. Um, you know, coal-fired power plants are a significant source of pollution and they're a significant source of, um, of uh, lung and respiratory disorders that claim tens of thousands of American lives every year. So those are just two brief comments. Yeah, and, I, and uh, we probably time doesn't permit us to get too far in the weeds on the carbon tax versus versus uh, uh, you know, carbon trading um, markets. Um, although maybe we could, if if that's of interest, uh, we can we can respond to that in in Q and A. That's sort of a big big issue. Uh, and uh, um, other thoughts in terms of of you know what else ought we to be doing at the at the policy level. Uh, that would really make a difference in this space. And Emily, I see you've unmuted, so Emily? Yeah, I'm happy to, to uh, respond. So I think a good example is what Colorado is doing, where you've gone beyond uh, just talking about a renewable portfolio standard or you know introducing renewables, but also talking about ways to further electrify. So introducing 100% electric vehicles, as well as looking for incentives for electric heating, and then you know even going beyond that of introducing um, changes or requesting changes changes on the oil and gas side. I mean, you'll you you may have heard that BP recently announced that they're moving towards net zero by 2050. Um, and that is in support of the uh, Paris Agreement, as well as just in general, they're seeing the writing on the wall. I mean, and that's a perfect example of a private company, a very large private company that has made, you know, a lot of money in oil and gas for 100 years plus, and they've decided to focus on renewables and have 50 gigawatts by 2030. I mean, that's just massive. And a lot of that is gonna come in the US and a lot of that's gonna come through LightSource BP and a lot of that's gonna come back to Colorado. And so I think that's a perfect example of, you know, pushing forward initiatives that then introduce interest in the industry to invest. And so I think it's a good example of going beyond just saying, okay, we want, you know, uh, electrification or even just electricity reduction and carbon emissions, you really have to think beyond that and push the industries that are traditionally pollu heavy polluters uh, to think differently. You know, one example that we're doing, for instance, is we're working on a pilot in Australia with BP on green hydrogen. And we're also looking at, and you know, we're assessing opportunities in the U.S. as well. And that's going to happen through combination of policy, incentivizing people to come forward and actually um, invest, as well as, um, you know, that's really transitioning heavy fuels, which are a major emitter, um, into a clean environment. And it's utilizing, you know, clean uh, solar, which comes from the sun. And so I think it's a great example of, you know, a public, again, I, I mentioned the public-private partnership, but that's vital because, if you don't get the in, uh, large industry to invest, then you're unlikely to see the massive change in moving out of a niche market into a uh, you know large scale. Yeah, and I could you uh, thank you for that. And you could add in in Colorado, Excel Energy, the utility here is has been a real leader in this space. A very aggressive targets, um, um, and and similar story there. I think in terms of a, a you know, private utility that is really uh, taking a stand that's pretty aggressive um, in, in that space and will drive a lot. Um, I know we're, 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 we're very limited in time. This is such a massive, fascinating topic. I wish we had uh, all day to talk. Uh, in a couple of minutes, we're gonna open up for the, for the Q&A. Uh, I did wanna um, return to Senator Bennett, if I could, uh, uh, you, uh, to, to reflect a bit, what, you know, maybe on what you've just heard, but also, uh, you know, to, to, to put into context from your perspective, what it, just what it will take for the U.S. to, uh, to move from fourth to first or to be a leader in this whole space. So first of all, the, the panel has made me incredibly proud to live in Colorado. And I think we're, we're, we're providing real leadership here that I think can be picked up at the national level. I mentioned to Kelly, who's the, the Colorado native, will take you back anytime <laughs> want to come back. And she said, and she's right, the scientists at the IPCC tell us we've got to achieve 100% net zero carbon emissions across the globe no later than 2050. And, and as she said, as Kelly said, how governments use their budget is a real reflection of whether we're 
taking it seriously. And to, to do that, to take it seriously, I think we're going to find that we're going to have to invest roughly around 2% of GDP annually in climate solutions, including a significant investment in communities on the front lines that are most in harm's way. And, th and that all brings me to the second point. You know, that, that, that's, what, that's an objective that we have to have. We have been discussion about the pricing signals that we want to send, all of that kind of stuff. And the point I want to leave you with before we go to questions is, there is no two-year or four-year solution to climate change. You know, if you look at our healthcare debate, if you can call it a debate over the last 10 years, um, we can't accept the politics that's undergirded that debate and believe that we're going to come up not just with an urgent solution to climate change, but a solution that will actually endure across administrations and even generations. I was asked a question once in Iowa, can Western democracy solve climate change? I said, you have just asked the most existential question mm. anybody in a town hall has ever asked because actually it's an open question. Yeah. But we're at the Corbell School right now. So let me make this observation. We didn't win the Cold War two years at a time. We used to have something called American foreign policy. And when we had a president who was elected, who was a Republican or a Democrat, they knew roughly what their job was with respect to the Soviet Union or the Cold War or the alliances that we had struck around the world. And it's my view that we need something like we had American foreign policy that we think of as American climate policy. that doesn't change from administration to administration in hugely material ways. That's in some ways, it may sound like a heavy burden, and it is true that it means that you not only have to get the policy right, you've also got to get the politics right. You can't lose to climate deniers like Donald Trump. You've got to have a vision that can galvanize a broad coalition of Americans and make it stick. And the good news is, I think that coalition is hiding in plain sight. You know, there, there is unfortunately one of the, you know, terrible results of the Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United is that it allowed the Koch brothers to basically conflate their economic interests with the American people's economic interests. Mm. And, and elected climate deniers have done the same thing. That means that they are way out of step with the reality of what the American people are facing. And I think that, you know, these climate denying politicians find themselves locked into a position that is way out of whack with the majority of Americans in almost every single congressional district in this country. They're at odds with leading American businesses. They're at odds with a growing number of evangelicals and an overwhelming number of voters under 30 in this country. And elected politicians who deny climate science also occupy a political reality that is very separate from Colorado, the, the, the physical reality that increasingly confront Colorado's farmers, ranchers, and foresters who see the land changing dramatically before their eyes. And so the climate denying position should be an untenable position. The reason it, it's not is that we have failed to construct a politics around climate that's attractive to a broad enough cross-section of voters and that answers the economic concerns that people have which is the point of this panel. And we have got to get over the idea that it's enough just to galvanize the people who already see climate as a priority. We have to do better than that to build a sustainable, durable solution. And that means we've got to reach out to people who have a direct stake in climate issues, but haven't been engaged in our current debate. And I, I think that means making a forceful case that emphasizes the business potential of climate high paying jobs and pocketbook savings that are going to come from climate action, along with the dire economic costs of, of inaction. It also means pursuing ideas to invest in land conservation and stewardship, which not only will preserve vital carbon sinks, but will reward America's farmers, ranchers, and foresters for being part of the solution. Uh, and as I said previously, and I'll, I'll come to a close, it mm -hmm. means tackling head on the very real need that, that, that workers and communities facing dislocation will have as a result of the changing economy. So let me end with this. 
We cannot allow actors, self-interested actors like the Koch brothers, stall American progress just to serve their narrow interests. We've seen this before. It's not unknown in American history. Before coal, America's trains and ships ran on chopped wood. Uh, but before petroleum, America's families lit their homes with oil from whale blubber. And you can just imagine if we were in the 19th century, a bunch of lobbyists and super PACs forced us to preserve an energy economy based on logs and whales. You know, it's, it's funny to think about it, but if that had happened, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We wouldn't be a global superpower today if we approached the problem the way you know, some elected officials are approaching it today. So I just think we're at a very similar inflection point now. Yeah. The, the country needs to lead on climate solutions, not only so we can do what we have to do for the planet and the next generation, but so that we can win the race for the 21st century clean energy economy. And I, I believe our success in Colorado, it gives me tremendous confidence that we can do it. And I think we will. Well, thanks, Senator, so much for those uh, comments. You really put it in a big, big perspective. I know when I teach about climate change, I say this is the greatest collective action challenge we've ever faced. That is to say, it is fundamentally a political challenge and a, a test of whether we are able collectively to govern in a way that leads to sensible policies in the public interest. And so we will, we have a great task ahead of us, well, I, certainly for I, our I don't want to take any more more time than you've already given me, but I just want to stitch what you just said back to what you said at the very beginning, which is, though this is global in scope, uh, it's direct actions at the local level that are going to make the difference. And that is, that is why it is so important for us to be able to construct a, a political answer here that can connect those two things, which I think we can. Absolutely. Now, um, I, I will tell I know we're limited time now, but uh, thank you so much, Senator. Uh, let me turn to the questions uh, and then we'll get to as many as we can. Um, first, uh, first question is uh, around uh, uh, three, uh, from David Klein. Um, 3,500 3, U.S. economists signed a letter of support for carbon pricing in the form of a fee and dividend policy. There are other ways. Comment on the relative role of of carbon pricing versus other policies such as regulation, R&D, infrastructure, investment, et cetera, to uh, best uh, position the U.S. in this space. How important is carbon pricing um, as a part of this puzzle? And I would, I don't know who would like to take that on our uh, panel. I mean, maybe Senator Bennett will <laughs> we'll turn it back to you. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. I think that, um, it's, I, I believe it's all important. Uh, there's a, there, there, are, there are people in the political world now after they saw what happened in France uh, with Macron who, who are sort of making the, taking the view that there's no way that we'll ever be able to price carbon. I, I disagree with that. I think that if we have a thoughtful way of doing it that the American people can understand that is in the context of a broader discussion about the inequity in our tax code at a time when um, uh, we've got the worst income inequality that we've had since 1928. There's a lot for us to do with that tax code. And uh, the, a, a well-constructed price on carbon, whether it's cap, cap and dividend or a carbon tax, um, could actually result in a carbon tax cut for the American people. You know, that's really possible. Uh, uh, others would obviously have to bear the, 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 the cost of that. So I think that's very, very, you know, I, I think it, it's, uh, I also believe there are a lot of folks in the private sector who think the most efficient way to drive the behaviors that we all want to see driven uh, is to price carbon. That, that, that's a more efficient way of doing it than through regulation. Um, and there may be a political um, uh the possibility of a, of a, a political settlement there. So I, I think it's important, but not the only essential thing. You know, as, as you know, the utility sector is, is mostly willingly right now transitioning to net zero carbon in the next 20 or 30 years. That's gonna take a massive capital infusion to be able to do that. It's not, the price in carbon is not gonna do that um, alone. And, and I think that, you know, if we think about it, the coming stimulus that um, 
that, that the next administration is going to have a chance to do, that gives us the opportunity for more investments in clean energy tr transition and the chance, I think, to create massive economic growth that's a product of addressing climate and greenhouse gas emissions. So this is all a good news story. I, 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 I often say it wasn't Donald Trump's fault that he ran and won based on a lie about climate, but it is a burden that all of us need to carry to make sure that we are in the, uh, the, the, the political marketplace and square with a set of ideas that's going to uh, be appealing and attractive. And my point, the point I want to make, and I'll stop, is I don't believe you have to abandon your principles to do that. In Colorado, we haven't, far from it. We have, we have uh, followed our principles and they have led us to U.S. leadership on this question. I think we can do the same thing and lead the U.S. to global leadership. All right. Thank you, uh, Senator, for that. Let me, let me get another question in here from Jackson Burroughs, really asking a bit about the transition. Really, uh, it's a question about the natural gas as a bridge between non-renewable uh, and renewable energy sources, this uh, ongoing discussion. Um, and, and his question is, simply put, is relying on natural gas, is relying on natural gas as a bridge necessary? Um, and I, uh, who would, who might want to take that one on? I'll bring in, uh, I'm going to watch the first person to unmute, uh, is, uh, or I'm going to call on you. Um, Colin. Sure, I, you know, if, thanks boss. Uh, no, happy to take that question. I, I mean, I think that, you know, when we think about these kind of transition sort of energy types, right? If we think that this is something that can, can be effective in helping bridge, Obviously, we're going to need some of those energy sources. We cannot turn over our private or commercial vehicle fleet uh, in a matter of a couple of years. Um, we've seen during COVID what happens when you have the kind of rapid uh, decarbonization and the rapid reduction in uh, the use of, of, of traditional um, energy resources be due to the economic shutdown. So it's not something that can happen overnight. And I think this is why the Senator's point is well taken about thinking much more long term. And so natural gas will continue to be an energy source that is used in the United States for some time. But if we are able to do these other policy interventions, right? So we're able to make the large scale investments necessary to bring about um, essentially technological innovation and scalability in renewable energy. At the same time that we're allowed, that, we're, that we start using carbon pricing to, put, to give everyone some skin in the game so that our individual choices about how many car trips we make or what kind of vehicles we purchase are also reflective of the total cost to society of, of, of using these kinds of energy sources. So if we do all of those things at the same time, I think that that, that would be just a necessary component. Now, natural gas is not going to go away tomorrow, but it will begin to be phased out uh, if for no other reason because of cost competitiveness and environmental regulation moving forward as these other energy sources become relatively more uh, economically competitive on their own merits, regardless of the environmental argument for them. Uh, thanks for that, Colin. If, if anyone's interested, there's a great story about what the city of Asheville did working with Duke Power or Duke Energy uh, to avoid building a carb, uh, natural gas plant uh, involved uh, a tremendous amount of community action and ways of uh, essentially reducing demand so that they didn't have to build that. So uh, let, me, let me get another uh, question in. Uh, Abdullah Shar Sharafi? Um, about electrifying vehicles. Uh, there are two lines of thought. Um, one is to have vehicles uh, energized by batteries, the other to energize vehicles through fuel cell technology, which uses hydrogen, which makes more sense. Maybe Doug, uh, you, you, you're in the uh, battery business. Uh, can you talk about the future of batteries in this, in this space? Yeah, I'll give you an incredibly unbiased uh, response. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, to be honest, there's, there's a role for both. Um, I think that the challenge with fuel cells is obviously you need a hydrogen source and you need an infrastructure around that. And, and so that would require massive, massive, massive investments, whereas obviously we have an electrical grid. Honestly, if, you know, if I look into my crystal ball and I, I look at, at electrification, or I'm sorry, transportation of the future, I think you're going to see fuel cells used for long haul type vehicles um, because it addresses kind of the, the range challenge associated with electric vehicles. And then for, you know, in, in city, more urban environments, electric vehicles just make sense, um, you know, from a usage case and an economic case. Right, I just, just step in at the tail end of that. 
it's Thank very you. a limited seed stock of these kind of renewable, especially green hydrogen at this time. And one of the things we have to think about in the transition is really long haul travel, like freight by air and passenger travel by air and shipping. I mean, we, we ship 90% of the world's trade and green hydrogen has a massive amount of potential to decarbonize shipping. So when we're thinking about priorities, when we have electric solutions available for cars, maybe we should save the limited feedstock of green hydrogen, which we hope will grow. We need the hydrogen revolution for some of those longer haul travels or incentivize it for those purposes. Thank you for that. Maybe we have, I guess we really only have time maybe for one more. I'm going to turn to, uh, and I apologize to all of you who've who put uh, questions in the q and I'm sorry we can't get to them all. Uh, Lindsay Treiba, uh, to Senator Bennett, you mentioned dedicating 2% of GDP per year to climate policy. Um, what are concrete policies that, you, that will lead to, at, at the federal level, to mitigate climate change? Green New Deal, carbon capture, carbon credit, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks for the question. I, I think in the end, it's going to be a combination of direct investment, uh, figuring out how to price carbon, uh, and making sure that the American people uh, have the chance to, um, uh, uh, to, to understand uh, what the stakes are here, uh, both in terms of climate, but also in terms of the economy. And I think if we can do that, um, we'll succeed. And I, and I believe we will. Well, thank you for that, Senator. Thank you for being here. Let me thank uh, all of our panelists. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is such a fascinating topic. We should do it again on a long and, and have a bit more time, but we are out of time. Uh, let me also thank all of you in the audience for joining us today. Um, uh, thank you for your interest in the topic. Um, and uh, as the Senator said, we all have a the challenge that all of us together have to work on uh, probably for the rest of our lifetimes. So with that, let me close. Uh, hope, wish you all a, a, a great rest of your day and thank you for being with us. Bye everyone.